any time now. I'm just trying to keep track of people muted and such, but go ahead. <laughs> Okay, so one of the challenges of posting from home is we're trying to get our dogs squared away so they don't make a whole bunch of noise. <laughs> so, Mine are um, currently barking downstairs as well. So, <laughs> um, Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation by Emily Haber, German ambassador to the United States, who will speak to us on German-American relations after the elections. I'm Janice Weiner. Um, you will notice I am not the executive, I'm not the director of ICFRC, I'm the executive director of CIVIC, a, a partner organization, and the host for today's program. We would like to take a moment to thank our members, volunteers, and interns for making these forums possible. I would like to acknowledge our university and community supporters, the University of Iowa's international programs, the University of Iowa's honors program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their financial support. I also thank City Channel 4 and UI Libraries Digital Archives for continuing to help us make our programs available to online audiences. Our format today will be a little bit different. Following our speaker's presentation, we will open up to a moderated discussion with a few questions prepared in, in advance by our board members and interns. Then we'll turn as usual to audience submitted questions via the chat section of Zoom. Unlike our typical programs, we invite you to turn on your video for the discussion portion of the program, but please keep your audio muted throughout. It is now my pleasure to introduce Ambassador Emily Haber. Emily Haber has been Germany's ambassador to the United States since June 2018. Prior to her transfer to Washington DC, she served in various leadership functions in the Foreign Office in Berlin. In 2009, she was appointed political director and in 2011, state secretary, the first woman to hold either post. Thereafter, she was deployed to the Federal Ministry of the Interior serving as state secretary in charge of Homeland Security and Migration Policy from 2014 until 2018. Ambassador Haber holds a PhD in history and is married to former diplomat Hans-Jörg Haber. I have the pleasure of, of having known both the Habers personally since the mid 1990s when we all served together in Ankara, Turkey, and, the, and can tell you that the US is indeed fortunate to have Ambassador Haber as the German ambassador in these challenging times. The United States and Germany share a long and steadfast friendship. Both countries are allies within NATO and share fundamental values as well as common interests. Recently, disputes over dis defense spending, tariffs, and sanctions have put a strain on this partnership. At the same time, the major global challenges of our time, including the COVID-19 pandemic, global warming, and international terrorism require the United States, Germany, and Europe to stand together. Today, German Ambassador Haber will speak on the future of this important partnership following the recent US presidential elections. Um, and before I hand it over to you, Ambassador, I'd also like to express our condolences uh, on the tragic events in Trier today. Um, we in the US, unfortunately, have known way too many tragedies and please accept our condolences. So please, but now please join me, join me in welcoming Ambassador Emily Haber. Thank you, Janice, uh, for this uh, introduction. And may I say my one of my last trips before the pandemic struck brought me to Iowa, where I observed a democracy in action, which was incredibly impressive uh, for someone who'd never witnessed it uh, the way it's being practiced in Iowa. And also, may I say to you, uh, I remember very well our time together in Ankara, and I've never forgotten. Uh, and it was, um, uh, you were a role model for me in, uh, to, to some extent. I've never forgotten your commitment uh, to human rights in Ankara. I seem to remember that at the time you even re received a prize, uh, a prize uh, for that. So thank you for inviting me and it's wonderful to see you again. And, and thank you for joining us. So over to you. Um, you said uh, rightly uh, that Germany and the United States enjoy long and steadfast friendship. Um, nowadays, when people ask me about the future of the relationship, some seem to indicate uh, 
as if the elections were a watershed moment uh, for the bilateral relationship. And while it is true that we had some issues over the past years, all the issues, Janice, that you've just mentioned on burden sharing, for example, uh, or uh, uh, trade issues, um, or um, well, gas pipeline issues, well, it's fair to say that these are not new issues uh, on which we have uh, disagreed. Uh, we've um, discussed them and sometimes disagreed about them uh, um, over uh, um, years before uh, the uh, Trump administration. So um, any uh, assumption that we somehow return to some halcyon days uh, in the bilateral relationship doesn't get the essential point that at all times, even though we are uh, steadfast friends and allies, uh, and we agree on uh, uh, values, uh, and we agree on many, many issues actually uh, uh, across the world, even then uh, there have been times uh, when um, differences have tested uh, our unity or resolve, and sometimes uh, disputes have, um, have uh, um, eroded uh, uh, unity and resolve. Uh, we have, um, we come from different vantage points uh, in some contexts, for example, on data protection or on, uh, right now on clim uh, climate uh, protection or on regulation and yes, on security, you mentioned uh, uh, burden sharing. Uh, um, but uh, that is neither here nor there. Um, over the past years, um, yeah, the present administration has thrown over board a number of foreign policy orthodoxies that were relevant, relevant uh, over many years, especially uh, the shift from previous internationalism uh, to America first policies, which were mainly understood uh, in economic terms. There's also the uh, uh, turning the back to uh, democracy promotion uh, from the Reagan and Bush years, or the resolve to end uh, um, endless wars. Uh, all of that um, was a, um, a fundamental change in policies. But what people overlook is the reasons um, that actually, whether you agree with disruptive decisions and tactics or not, the reasons uh, why these occurs, uh, occurred. And there were reasons uh, why uh, people took a critical uh, um, uh, it took a uh, critical uh, look at the status quo of the international landscape. And that is the change of the international uh, landscape. You've mentioned it already in geopolitical terms and in geoeconomic terms, the incredible rise of China uh, as technological superpower, as economic uh, superpower, the return of Russia as a revisionist uh, military uh, uh, power, um, the um, uh, an unchecked uh, globalization, uh, if you like. Um, um, and all of that, um, and an international institutional and in, to some extent also procedural landscape that didn't really fit all these changes uh, anymore. Look at uh, NATO. Um, uh, today, uh, um, in, uh, at the NATO ministerial, um, the reflection group has put forward proposals for a change of NATO. And there's a reason for that because NATO for many, many decades had reflected a, a geopolitical status quo and uh, challenges uh, that are not exactly uh, reflective of the, uh, of the challenges today. And the same is true uh, for other international organizations. The United Nations, the Security Council reflects the status quo of the post-World War uh, years. Uh, the WTO reflects a status quo uh, that was pre-accession of uh, China, even though China, an economic superpower, is now member to the WTO. So my argument is, uh, um, whether you agree with disruptive policies or not, uh, um, it, uh, the observation is in place that the reasons that led to the critical uh, um, uh, uh, to the critical take of the international landscape are still in place and will still be relevant uh, for uh, the next administration. So um, some things will change, some things won't change. I think the change on uh, we'll be seeing will be the take on alliances, uh, uh, on international agreements, on rules and uh, and um, uh, some treaties on multilateral action, on structures of global and regional global uh, governance. 
because over the past years, the world by the administration has largely been seen uh, as an arena um, for bilateral competition or even confrontation. Uh, and with international rules and regulations and sometimes treaties as seen as an obstacle uh, to the pursuit of America first interests. And if you look at the world from this vantage point, sometimes allies and friends look like foes uh, and leadership is mostly defined as having the power to make others uh, toe the line. So I assume from what the people from the Biden administration have said publicly, what they have published, uh, um, that we'll see not only a different, uh, uh, a different style and tonality, but we'll also see a different thinking as regards allies uh, and alliances. Um, the global environment will be no less exacting uh, as it was uh, before. Um, and the internal constraints uh, will be too. But allies and like-minded and alliances uh, will be seen as part of um, collective uh, power projection. So it means that combining collective hefts uh, means that you are stronger, that you can leverage power, that you can uh, project your power and the power of all, uh, all of your allies, um, um, which in turn will also mean uh, factoring in interest, not necessarily your own, because if you want compromises and if you want collective action, uh, and if you want uh, the common ground to be as large as possible, uh, uh, well, leadership will mean uh, uh, shaping alliances around that. So um, what will also be relevant uh, for the next administration is what happened over the past years, because people haven't been sitting on their hands over the past years. We've seen part of the legacy uh, uh, will certainly be um, uh, that other actors, China in particular, but not only China, Russia too, uh, have tried to use uh, uh, those years, especially in international organization, uh, to extend uh, their capacity uh, for uh, impacting or influencing. Uh, you see that in the you see that in all international organizations actually that have been left by the United States, the UNESCO, or the WHO. Uh, um, or the Human Rights uh, uh, Council. So that will be one of the legacies to deal with. Um, another legacy will be uh, that disruptive tactics have been copied by others. You see that uh, if you look at Turkey in, in the Mediterranean, but also with regard to Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, where they use disruption in order to change the uh, status quo. Um, but it doesn't mean that disruption uh, disrupt the, the critical look at the international landscape uh, and the, um, the architecture, the institutional setup uh, and the rules uh, that come with it um, has also led uh, worldwide, uh, including uh, among Europeans and Germans uh, to a much greater sense uh, that actually um, uh, the institutional uh, setup needs uh, reform, needs adaption, needs change. Uh, we were never convinced uh, that you would be able to uh, restart from scratch, uh, um, not least given the fact that when the present international order was set up, this was at the height, at the apex of American power uh, and um, not being the only kids on the block anymore, it, it means that others will try to shape uh, um, any new uh, uh, landscape. But the sense of urgency uh, for adaption and for change has certainly been increased uh, over the past years. And that allows, uh, um, to some degree, also leveraging uh, um, uh, this legacy uh, for necessary change. Um, now, I haven't mentioned one point. Uh, it will be my last, and it's the central point, which is uh, Americans and Europeans and Canadians and Japanese and South Koreans and South Australians, Canadians, we all agree on one central issue, and that is values. I'm not saying that in an academic uh, sense. I'm saying that we largely agree on the values that we think are relevant for our democracies and for technology. And as the um, competitive race uh, 
uh, of, um, uh, of the future uh, will happen in the arena of technology. Uh, and um, the standards that will define this arena and will define uh, the technologies of the future will in turn hugely impact on our societies. So obviously it cannot be trivial whether we agree on the principles and the values uh, that will determine uh, 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 these uh, standards so relevant for our societies. And we agree on them. We agree on wanting protect, to, uh, to protect ourselves. We want to protect our capacity for innovation. We want to protect our competitiveness. We want to advance uh, the norms uh, and the standards and the principles and the values uh, uh, that will uh, shape uh, tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow's world. And we want to be aligned. Americans with Americans, uh, Europeans, among them Germans, but with as many democracies as we possibly can. Because again, and that's my final point, uh, the world has changed. The balance of the world has changed. Uh, China and the uh, relationship, uh, the competition with China will probably shape the 21st century. And if we want to hold our ground, and if we want to advance what is important to us, uh, then we need as much as, uh, alignment uh, as we possibly can get. But I'm not pessimist, uh, I'm not a pessimist on that. Because if I look around the world, um, I believe that the normative cloud, I don't like to call it the West anymore because it is uh, uh, frankly a notion uh, uh, that is somehow geogra geographically defined. The West is much bigger, uh, of today is much bigger. Um, and if we look uh, across the world, um, I think that citizens in all over the world look towards the United States, and look towards Europeans, uh, look towards democracies uh, to, because they have, uh, they offer liberty, they offer choices, uh, uh, they uh, off, uh, offer individual responsibility. So if we use that um, normative clout, um, and if we do it in a way uh, uh, not targeting each other, then I think we'll have a very good chance in uh, the race and the competition of tomorrow's world. Over to you, Janice. Um, so thank you very much. Um, we have, as I, as I um, mentioned at the beginning, we have a number of questions that, the, that uh, staff and interns and the board of ICFRC have put together. Um, and before we turn to audience questions, I would like to put a few of these to you, if you don't mind. So you spoke, you spoke very eloquently about the, how the, the ground has shifted and that, that many countries now recognize the need for alliances to adapt and to change. Um, one of the key alliances, which uh, you, you talked about as well, it, is NATO. Are there, um, do you, what concrete steps do you at this point think are most necessary for, for the alliance to become more effective at dealing with the threats it faces now, seven decades after its founding and, and following sort of four years of, uh, of America first, uh, and also with a view to some of these technological issues and, and perhaps cyber threats that you referred to? Yeah. Um, to, uh, as I mentioned already, um, uh, the, um, there's a ministerial today in Brussels. It is discussing just these questions address these questions. Um, uh, more than a year ago, uh, we have set up a reflection group uh, in the United Nations, uh, in the uh, in NATO, uh, uh, chaired by both the United States uh, and Germany. And they've put forward a report which will be published tonight. Uh, I haven't read it <laughs> as yet. Um, but what I am certain of uh, um, is what we'll see is, NATO today, um, or the NATO of today, reflected uh, um, uh, geopolitical and technological and military uh, challenge uh, of uh, past decades. But the huge challenges of our time are new uh, uh, technologies, our frontier uh, technologies, uh, our uh, cyber. Uh, they have uh, shifted geographically. Uh, uh, previously, NATO has mostly uh, uh, looked towards Russia uh, if it defined its geographic challenges. Uh, 
for the first time and NATO has today discussed or yesterday has discussed uh, the challenge uh, that is presented by China. So um, it will have to adapt in terms of technological uh, and security challenges. It will have to adapt in terms of uh, geographic challenges. It will have to redefine uh, the, um, uh, 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 the competition. Um, and uh, we have also returned over the past years. Look, if we've met 15 years ago and you'd asked me what are the key uh, security challenges for us, I think I would have answered, and I think so would you, uh, um, transborder challenges, terrorism, uh, um, uh, terrorism uh, that is um, uh, cannot be localized uh, um, uh, within national borders, uh, because that were, uh, these were the, the attacks we've seen in the past. Well, over, the, uh, over recent years, uh, we've seen the return of traditional uh, great power competition, whatever you call it, if you want to name it that way, but uh, we've seen that challenges, in fact, came again uh, um, uh, from, um, from geograph uh, geographic uh, national uh, competitors. So all of that uh, um, will have to be faced uh, by NATO. And if the past disagreements uh, or um, um, a strong tonality uh, um, among allies in NATO have produced something um, it is a sense of urgency and a sense of purpose uh, that we cannot uh, uh, rest um, satisfied with ourselves uh, on the status quo uh, because it will weaken us. Um, that leads right into the next question really because you also mentioned the world hasn't, has not stood still over the last four years. Um, realities have changed, personalities have changed. Um, President-elect Joe Biden recently released his nominees um, for his foreign policy team, uh, as well as some other uh, cabinet positions. And many of those people have ser served previously in the Obama administration. Um, what is your sense as to how the German and European policy, foreign policy establishment view these nominees? Are they seen as a continuation or what, as, as many as some here in the US do? Or what is, what is your view of that? Um, I expect they themselves wouldn't see it as a continuation because the world has changed. Uh, the environment has uh, changed. Uh, the challenges after COVID uh, has changed the world uh, too because it obviously uh, has been seen by, uh, by China, uh, certainly by China, but by others too, uh, as an opening uh, uh, for more muscular uh, behavior. So just returning uh, to uh, or trying to restore a previous status quo uh, uh, is delusional. Uh, we have to adapt uh, to the world, how it is, how it has evolved, uh, evolved over the past years. And we'll have to do uh, um, a, a lot of uh, adaptive uh, work. Also, we've just gone through a pandemic. You have, uh, Europeans have, the rest of the world have, and we haven't seen the end of it. And we haven't seen the impact uh, uh, of it uh, either. So that will have to be factored in. What I mean by that is I assume that the respective uh, latitudes uh, also in financial and economic terms uh, for any administration here, but also for governments uh, in Europe, uh, have uh, uh, grown smaller. We'll have to deal with that as well. And you know, we have a lot of experience in managing. Uh, um, if we have difference, we, we have a lot of experience in managing differences or different uh, uh, advantage points. Uh, what is relevant is that we never lose out of sight uh, that our strength um, stems from um, common ground and collective action and from uh, coordination. It is certainly uh, the strategic objective uh, uh, of many um, of our well, adversaries or um, others uh, to um, divide us uh, because it will uh, increase their asymmetric uh, uh, weight in bilateral situations. That's something uh, we should not allow to happen. So my answer to you is we won't see a return to a status quo because the status quo is no more there. It has changed. It has changed. Uh, um, for many, many reasons, uh, um, because of events, because of new developments, because of American policies, because of responses uh, to that, because of uh, uh, 
uh, because of reasons that have uh, that are completely unrelated uh, uh, to uh, either the United States uh, or Europe, and we'll have to tackle uh, that. So any uh, assumption of uh, um, of restoration or returning uh, to a previous situation uh, would uh, would get it wrong uh, because we'd not be able to tackle uh, what really confronts us now. The um, that, that all makes enormous sense. So, sorry, we got one of our dogs in the background. The, um, the, uh, on November 9th, Chancellor Merkel um, congratulated President-elect Biden um, and um, welcomed the results of the election. Um, do you have a sense of what other political parties, aside from the Christian Democratic Union, what their views are at this point toward the incoming administration? Oh, well, um, the chancellor congratulated uh, the president-elect because that's what happens uh, um, in uh, situations of these uh, kind. Now, one of the key differences over the past year, uh, um, over the past years, between the United States uh, and Europeans uh, was the take of the United States on uh, the European Union. Um, it was not seen by everyone, but by some. Uh, as a regional governance organization uh, that uh, was actually um, that would, uh, was actually an obstacle uh, to um, to the pursuit of American and interest. That's why uh, they tried to bilateralize situations, and it is well known uh, uh, that there was public criticism of the European uh, Union uh, as a well, structure of uh, global governance. Now, I understand where this was coming from. Um, but the German take was a completely different one. And so was the take of most uh, of actually every other, uh, every single other uh, member of the European Union. We, we are not like the United States. Uh, uh, we're not the single most powerful uh, country in the world. Um, if you are, you may decide uh, that uh, uh, the international order and structures and agreements uh, prevent you from doing what you think is best. Um, but small countries or medium-sized countries, and Germany is a medium-sized country, uh, don't have the luxury to do that. Uh, we depend, and we are one of the most globalized countries in the world, we depend uh, on the system of rules and uh, institutional setups uh, and structures uh, and agreements uh, um, that promise predictability to us and transparency. It's our lifeline. Uh, it's been our lifeline over past decades. So if these uh, lifelines are being targeted, uh, um, then it's actually existential uh, uh, for us. Uh, and that has colored to a great uh, uh, degree uh, uh, the reception of the uh, election results uh, in Germany. The, uh, you mentioned both other challenges on the world stage as well as sort of challenges of the pandemic. Uh, one of the one area where the U.S. has, over the past several years, differed uh, strongly with with most countries in the world is on climate change. Um, the the Biden the Biden has said he will rejoin the the, the Paris Agreement. Um, in Germany, one of the, the one of the um, one of the plans or promises that's been made is to eliminate uh, reliance on carbon fuels by 2050. Um, at the same time, you have the, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline being completed um, with potential Russian leverage. Could you explain to us a little bit how those all play together, how whether uh, with respect to both the reduction of reliance on carbon and also how Germany avoids sort of be, having too much Russian influence with, with via this pipeline? Okay. Um, so obviously the pipeline uh, and our dependence on gas is a um, transition thing. As you pointed out, uh, by 2050, uh, uh, we uh, intend to be uh, carbon neutral and actually uh, uh, decisions have been taken uh, to use the opportunity of the pandemic and the crisis to accelerate uh, um, uh, this, uh, uh, this trajectory towards carbon neutral, fossil free, uh, um, uh, energy dependence. 
Um, so whatever is happening with terms in terms of uh, gas pipelines uh, will be an issue of transition. Now let's me let me turn to the gas pipeline. We've disagreed uh, on uh, gas pipelines um, uh, from Russia since I think the 1980s. It's been one of these old uh, disagreements. Uh, and it's not that I don't understand, uh, understand where the criticism come, uh, uh, comes from. Um, it's never been the German experience uh, that we've been uh, blackmailed, if you will, uh, uh, by um, Russians using or weaponizing gas imports uh, to Germany. But I do see that this has happened uh, in Georgia and it has happened uh, with regard to uh, Ukraine. And uh, I remember the winter 2011, I uh, believe, uh, uh, when um, most of Southeastern Europe really suffered uh, from the cold because of the uh, outstanding gas uh, imports. Um, but we tried, while understanding the concerns, we tried to uh, allay the concerns too. It wouldn't be possible to weaponize imports anymore because we have, uh, um, uh, we have reconstructed the pipeline system. Nowadays, you can pump gas into any direction, east and west and south and north. Uh, so um, if someone uh, should, if Russia should try to withhold gas for political reasons, well, we'd be able to replace it uh, uh, by dint of the reverse flow. Um, we also um, uh, did see the argument uh, of uh, Ukrainian vulnerability, which is why the chancellor pushed uh, for the trilateral gas agreement between Russia and Ukraine and the European uh, uh, Commission. Uh, it wouldn't have happened uh, without pushing uh, us uh, pushing uh, for it. Uh, and we have uh, a multi-annual uh, gas agreement now between, uh, between these uh, three uh, actors. So, Basically, my argument is uh, it will be a, transi a transition thing. Uh, um, we, have, uh, uh, um, we have made sure uh, that Russia is, not uh, is no more in a position uh, to actually weaponize uh, um, uh, gas uh, imports or uh, exports. Uh, um, and uh, I would say, uh, as the Biden administration, uh, administration agrees on the impact uh, uh, of uh, uh, a global warm, uh, warning, warming on security and uh, climate change on security, cooperation on um, uh, fossil free uh, and uh, carbon neutral uh, futures uh, uh, will offer a huge ground uh, for cooperation, uh, thereby hopefully uh, rele uh, relegating uh, the Nord Stream issue uh, to uh, um, uh, away from uh, uh, the uh, center stage of disagreements. Um, th thank you for that very clear explanation. Uh, one of the other things that we're seeing front and center, obviously also seen by the forum on which we're, we're holding this, um, this conversation right now is the effects of the pandemic. Um, what, how has the pandemic affected and impacted the work of ambassadors, um, your staff and others, uh, and, and how are you able to cope with that? Yeah, it, it, it has affected me as it has affected everyone else. Uh, uh, we're working from home. Actually, the embassy is, uh, is working with uh, alternating teams. Uh, um, we have uh, different clusters. Uh, I, I set up different clusters because I was convinced it was necessary uh, to um, uh, trace all the contacts of people who had uh, been inflicted by the pandemic uh, in order to make sure that the groups will be safe. And so far, we haven't seen any illnesses uh, uh, in, in the embassy uh, in uh, Washington. So we've been lucky uh, there. Obviously, traveling is not, uh, is not more possible. Um, I don't see, or very rarely see people. Sometimes I see people here, but always in very small numbers. I do a lot of uh, um, uh, Zoom meetings, but you know, it's not the same because normally if I speak to people, if I'd speak to all of you, I, I'd see you. I'd actually would see a note uh, if you were rolling your eyes because of the stupid stuff I say. I don't do that now. I don't, I cannot gauge your reaction. And that's bad for diplomats because that diplomats have to see um, actually, do they understand or do they think I'm talking um, nonsense? Um, and is this 
is there something I should explain better? And what are the reasons why you think it's wrong what I say? Um, I would be trying to put myself in your shoes. All of that is not possible if I talk to screens, uh, even if I attempt to, to answer your questions. Also, if, if I do demarches, for example, if I try to lay out a, a German um, a political position, say to Congress or to uh, uh, the administration, I mostly do it on the phone. And that's not the same. Um, because again, I, I, don't, I can't gauge the reaction. Uh, I sometimes notice uh, that people react by reading from a paper, which means if someone uh, answers me by reading from a paper, uh, uh, which you can always hear actually, um, then I know he hasn't, or well, she hasn't listened. It wasn't important. We're just like, uh, you know, uh, two people in separate rooms talking to themselves. <laughs> so that is, um, uh, that is uh, strongly sen um, uh, altering the work uh, uh, we do. And I hope it won't take, uh, uh, for much longer because it's it's impairing uh, actually the the human touch of diplomacy. The 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 human touch. I mean, you I, you say it very well there. I think that um, what I'm going to do now is sort of shift from the questions that were that were submitted in advance by by staff and board and. And in just a minute, I'm going to open it up to um, to our audience for questions, by, which I'll which which they can put in the chat, and which we will then moderate. Um, as you think about your questions for Ambassador Haber, I just want to remind you all of our next program, uh, next Wednesday, December 9th. Tom Countryman, who is board chair of the Arms Control Association, will be speaking on. 13,000 ways to die, the risk of nuclear war today. Um, he, he, he tries to come up with amusing titles for difficult topics. Um, I will tell you that, that Tom is another former foreign service colleague of mine. He really knows his stuff on arms control. So if you have any interest at all, you should sign up for that session as well. Um, so now if you have questions, uh, could you please put them in the chat? And as I said at the outset, so that, um, so that the Ambassador Hopper can see people's faces, you can feel free to put your cameras on. Just please um, stay muted for now, but um, allow her to see um, some of your faces and that would, be, that would be wonderful. And if you don't come up with questions, we'll have to ask um, some more of our own, but I'm sure you have, it's hard for me to believe you don't have questions. Um, and while people are thinking, I'd, I'd ask you a question that, that someone asked actually about Germany as, as we are sort of in, in political transition here. Does Germany have a populist movement that is similar to or equivalent to our um, Trumpism? Well, we have a populist movement. Uh, actually, we have a populist uh, right-wing party uh, in parliament. Uh, it emerged uh, in, uh, in the wake of the financial crisis and the disputes uh, uh, in Europe um, over bailing out and over mutualization of debt. So in its early days, it, it was um, a party that was focusing on uh, financial issues, on European structures uh, and on uh, well, German orthodoxies uh, on how to conduct uh, um, an economy that has changed over the uh, during the migration crisis, and I, as Dennis, uh, Dennis um, uh, mentioned, uh, I was at the uh, Interior Ministry at the time and uh, um, in charge of uh, migration. I remember how this emerged, uh, and it was related to reasons uh, that I think have given rise uh, to populist movements across the world, including populist thinking here because um, uh, it's one of the effects of globalization that actually um, uh, your capacity to take um, national decisions on what people or an electorate feels or people in the electorate feel is important is being ring fenced uh, by international law, by European law, uh, by uh, our uh, hyper-connectedness, et cetera. And that for democracies is always a problem because people look towards their political leaders and say, we've elected you and we don't want this. And uh, what are you going to do about it? And if governments have to say, well, uh, there's not much we can do right now about it because of 
um, international law or because of this is what the European Union has decreed, etc. So this it is this disconnect between what people expect from their governments in democracies and the effects of globalization uh, that have uh, been not the sole responsible factor uh, for the emergence of populism, but certainly one uh, uh, factor for it. So uh, nowadays, the uh, it's still um, a double as um, uh, low double digit uh, parties got some, I think, 11% uh, in the parliament, part of it is really uh, extreme. Um, they're having huge internal fights. And so far, uh, one effect of the pandemic in Germany has been, but these things are always very volatile, is that the um, people rallied around uh, the government, uh, rallied around the chancellor, uh, rallied around uh, both parties that uh, formed the government. We've seen fringes and very uh, um, uh, strong voices at the fringes which protest, uh, but it hasn't translated uh, into uh, a growing strength of the um, uh, populist movement uh, overall. The, um, we have a, a sort of a, a question that can tie on to that very well from, from the audience, which is um, the type Germany's elections, you, you conduct your elections differently than we do here, but they're proportional and multi-party. <clears throat> Given what you know about the, the US at this point, do you think it would help American politics if we had German style elections? No. <laughs> Um, you have different traditions, different histories, uh, and um, our um, uh, our present uh, uh, election system was uh, an answer, a response uh, after the Second World War uh, by um, um, a response to what our allies, then of course the uh, uh, the victorious powers, had realized uh, had led uh, to. Uh, um, Germany going down the extremist anti-democratic uh, path that led uh, to uh, uh, Nazism in Germany. So uh, um, it was a, it was a response to German history. So it was tailor-made, if you uh, if you will, uh, to the acknowledgement that a fragmented, highly fragmented party system before uh, 1933, uh, um, a lack of a democratic. Uh, uh, a, a lack of uh, democratic um, convictions uh, and um, uh, 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 a lack of democracy and democratic thinking in the country uh, and a procedural setup uh, that would fire up uh, the extremes uh, within the party system uh, that had to be dealt with. So my answer is, uh, Party systems are um, a reflection of the sum of experiences uh, uh, and uh, histories, uh, um, and cannot be uh, cannot be uh, um, a template uh, for every single other country. So my answer is no. So um, we have a somewhat relation uh, a question that's related that to that as well as to the pandemic to some to some extent. So the, the, you, you referred to um, the Germans on the whole being willing to look to current leadership in parliament and government to help deal with the pandemic. Um, and there, there's, Germany has something uh, in the post-war years more of a history uh, of looking to the state to help with general welfare than, than, than Americans necessarily mm -hmm. have. Do you have any sense that this is going to change in the near future? Um, the, the, the question the questioner ends by saying is is neoliberal economic thinking gaining any more adherence in Germany than it has in the past? Well, we're going through an extraordinary uh, period right now. So making predictions and extrapolating uh, right now is a risky affair. I'd be careful of that. But I would say this. Um, uh, Europe has, and Germany too has been hit harder uh, by the uh, economic effects of the uh, crisis than the US uh, uh, has. Uh, the OECD published the numbers uh, today and also published uh, the predictions for the next year. But you don't see it in the labor market. Um, look, uh, when we set up the recovery pact, the national recovery package in uh, 
um, in Germany, uh, we used um, an institutional possibility uh, that we set up back in 2008 during the financial crisis, uh, which allowed companies and businesses to retain uh, um, uh, their, uh, um, their employees in their jobs because uh, the state uh, would pay uh, up to 66 and 86 percent of their salary respectively or would refund the businesses in order to retain the people on the job and while as 1.4 million used these opportunities back in 2000 during the financial crisis in 2008 um, it was at the highest at the highest mark uh, 11 million uh, uh, this year so that gives you uh, a notion uh, of the degree uh, of how people would have been affected uh, had we not had uh, the uh, the system of refunding uh, um, um, uh, uh, salaries partly uh, uh, in place so that was hugely important and there was no doubt it was also important uh, for making people accept the hardships uh, that came uh, with the pandemic uh, and uh, the mandates uh, um, issuing uh, from the uh, uh, pandemic. So I don't, I think there's a general great acceptance uh, uh, right now that the state uh, did what it had to do. Uh, and I don't see a turn towards neoliberal thinking. It's also indicative in the uh, uh, discussions we're having within the European Union uh, on how to help other European countries. You remember that in 2008, during the financial crisis, uh, uh, the, any thinking about bailing out or mutualization of debts uh, among European countries was a taboo for Germany. Yeah. Well, uh, in this year, uh, we have actually decided, uh, we consider it as a one-off, uh, but we have decided uh, that the Commission should be able uh, to raise money on financial markets and to hand it out in terms of credits and uh, loans um, uh, to and grants uh, to European member states who will have to pay back, but only according to the share of uh, the uh, um, uh, of their share of the budget. So that's to some degree a one-off mutualization of debt, uh, which um, is really. Uh, um, a repudiation of, of previous uh, German economic thinking. That too uh, doesn't point uh, into the direction of neoliberal uh, uh, renaissance. Um, I, I, a more personal question is how, how did you present your credentials and to whom did you present your credentials and, and what was that like? Well, I present uh, the credentials uh, to President Trump uh, in the framework uh, that is uh, uh, usual for foreign diplomats to present the uh, credential, uh, credentials. There's a, uh, there's a procedure and a protocol for that, uh, and it was applied in my case too. Uh, hold on. I think there's one more. Um, I think this would probably, there, there are a variety of questions that have to do with sort of specific things like the, the troop withdrawal that, that um, President Trump recently announced of, I think, reducing American troops in Germany by 9,000 and whether you think the Biden administration would reverse that. Um, but I, mean, I think the question that sort of captures it all, and maybe we could use th this to, um, to put, draw this to an end, is what thoughts or recommendations would you have for the incoming administration on how to improve and advance relations with Germany and sort of perhaps expand that to the EU as well. Uh, well, do you want to react on the troop withdrawal? You, you see, well, I, I, I'll just say on that, uh, um, it's a completely normal thing to readjust uh, um, military presences elsewhere. It usually happens uh, in the context of changing threats or changing challenges or a changing uh, geopolitical environment, etc. And it is uh, within the purview of the country that sends the troops to make these decisions uh, on its own. I would also add that uh, 
in the discussion in the United States, it hasn't been properly reflected that actually American troops aren't in Germany to defend Germany. They're in Germany to defend uh, transatlantic security, including American security. Look in Stuttgart and in Wiesbaden, uh, um, uh, uh, American headquarters are coordinating operations which go far beyond the NATO uh, realm, uh, coordinating actions in uh, in um, 54 and 52 countries, uh, maybe on that, but it's more or less that, uh, respectively. Uh, so it's actually about transatlantic security and it is also about American power projection. Um, I'll leave it at this. Uh, what will happen there, I don't know. Uh, um, again, I'm sure decisions will be taken in the context of what makes uh, sense security-wise. Um, on the Second uh, uh, question, help me again, what was it? Just um, it's basically what, what advice ah. would you have generally to the incoming administration on how to um, improve, expand relations with, with Germany and then I added and, and with the EU as well? Um, well, I think that is, uh, I've, uh, um, like you, I served in uh, Moscow, uh, at, couple of years, actually twice in the 1980s and in the late 1990s and 2000s. So I, um, if when I say uh, that uh, over the past years, uh, uh, Russia has tried to exploit uh, to the best, uh, the best it could uh, uh, differences among uh, European partners because it suited uh, their strategic interest and it reinforced uh, 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 their positions, uh, then I think the first thing we'll have to tackle, not least with regard to China too, is make sure uh, that we work hand in glove. Yeah, uh, there, there will be some differences. That's normal within, uh, even uh, among the best of allies. Uh, but let's focus on where we actually agree uh, and let's make sure uh, that differences are not being uh, misunderstood. I believe that the transatlantic alliance and uh, the alliance of my country with uh, your country uh, is the single most factor, uh, most important uh, foreign policy relation uh, uh, that we Germans uh, have. There's, you're the most important partner uh, we have, uh, certainly outside of uh, the uh, European Union. And whether um, we, uh, we are seen as allies, Germans, but other Europeans too or not, will, an, will have an effect uh, on um, um, on how others, including China and including Russia, uh, uh, will think um, how far they uh, how far they think they can uh, go in pursuing their own interests. So, on in all areas, uh, global ones uh, like climate change, global warming, uh, on combating uh, terrorism, uh, uh, on um, uh, on uh, reorganizing and adapting uh, the uh, global order in defending uh, and advancing uh, norms and standards and principles uh, uh, that will determine the technologies of the future. Um, all of that are areas uh, that are so much more important uh, than individual uh, disagreements uh, on, well, you mentioned uh, Nord Stream. I, I always like to quote, I, I read it recently and it really charmed me. Um, I um, saw um, an essay by uh, Freud who said, uh, uh, he, he called it, I think, uh, the narcissism of minor differences, by which he meant uh, that uh, we're looking at issues where we disagree and to an outsider who's watching it from the fences, uh, he doesn't or she doesn't uh, get the relevance of it because to her or to him, they're completely trivial. And I think uh, there have been times uh, where um, we as allies have forgotten that. Um, really well said. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Ambassador Haber. Really appreciate your presentation and your willingness to take so many questions. I'd like once again to thank our sponsors, members, and interns for making these programs possible. Um, Ambassador Haber, as a very small token of our appreciation, we virtually present you and eventually somehow <laughs> will actually present you with the coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations mug. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Finally,
Actually, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that, that this is Giving Tuesday. Uh, and giving, giving money, giving funds to nonprofits help people who, there are nonprofits who help people who are in need. And there are also nonprofits such as this that help enrich our lives. I personally believe that we need both. So I thank you all once again for joining us. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you so much.